Thank you all very much for coming this evening. Uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of the New York City Russia Public Policy Series, which is jointly co-sponsored by the NYU Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia and the Harriman Institute here at Columbia. And we're able to put on events like this thanks to very generous funding from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Uh, the NYU, uh, the, the, <coughs> the New York City Russia Public Policy Series sponsors two to three events held both at NYU and at Columbia over the course of the semester, each semester. And we're trying to raise the profile of Russia in New York and have more and more events that are about contemporary public policy issues in Russia. Later on this semester, we'll feature an event, a post-analysis of the election that will be held at New York University on April 12th, if you want to mark your calendars. And on May 9th, which may be of interest to people in the audience here, we are tentatively scheduled at this point to host a debate between uh, Ambassador Michael McFaul and Stephen Cohen on the current state of US-Russian relations. Yeah. So mark that down in the calendars as well. That is tentatively scheduled for May 9th. We've been working hard to make it happen and uh, cautiously optimistic that it will happen. So we have more events going on this semester, um, but today I want to welcome Professor Timothy Fry, who is going to moderate uh, tonight's event, and I'm going to turn the event over to him for the introduction of our honored guest today. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very, thank you very much, Josh. I'm Tim Fry, the uh, chair of the political science department at uh, Columbia University and the former director of the Harriman Institute. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Ksenia Sobchak uh, this evening. Um, and I can keep it short, I think, because is there anybody in the room who doesn't know who Ksenia Sobchak is? Uh, she's one of the most recognizable faces in Russia. And given all the media that she has done in the United States in the last few days, I think she will become equally recognized uh, here uh, as well. Uh, I can say that she is a leading political journalist on TV Rain, the, the most important independent television station uh, in Russia. And now she is a candidate for the presidency of the Russian Federation. Um, my favorite description of her, though, comes from uh, Alexei Pivovarov, who was the former anchor of NTV, who in this very room, uh, six years ago, during a panel where we were discussing the protests and demonstrations that took place after the parliamentary elections of, of 2011, in talking about the dynamics of the protest, he said, Ksenia Sobchak played a very important role uh, because she's the person who made it cool to protest in Russia, which I think is a very... And now she's uh, uh, trying to make it cool to run for office in Russia as well. Um, so please join me in uh, welcoming Ksenia Sobchak. She'll speak for about 15 minutes. Uh, I'll ask a few questions, and then we'll open up the floor uh, to questions from the audience uh, as well. So please join me in welcoming Ksenia Sobchak. Thank you so much. And also, I hope that I'll make it cool for Russian politicians to come to America after this visit of mine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before beginning our discussion, I would like to thank you for being here today for your interest in Russia and Russia's affairs. I am very delighted to conclude my trip to the United States with a visit to legendary Columbia University, an outstanding research university that is very well known in Russia and that has very much contributed to the advance of science, humanism and the rule of law all over the world. Not to mention five founding fathers who graduated from Columbia, a number of distinguished scientists, alumni, who fight now for democracy and constitutionalism in their home countries. Among them, a man of courage, Enrique Capriles from Venezuela, who challenged Nicolas Maduro at the presidential election and is now banned from political life for 15 years. Among them, Michael Saakashvili, who has proved in Georgia that a democratic transit in post-Soviet countries is possible, and who is now fighting for a democratic and corruption-free Ukraine. Given the state of democracy in the world, Columbia University will have a lot of work to accomplish in these years to come. Well, during my visit here, I spoke to many people and uh, many journalists, and most of them ask one question, what 
did I come for here? <laughs> Let me be straightforward with you this time. You know, President Putin uh, is very famous not only for what he's doing now in Russia, but is also famous uh, for saying once that after the death of Mahatma Gandhi, he has no one to talk about. <laughs> well, after the publication of the Kremlin list, it seems like it's almost also no one to talk about mm -hmm. with Russians and from Russia. So here I am, you know, so that there would be someone to talk about Russia and Russia's problems. Because now it seems like it's not only Putin himself talking about our country and giving us all a message that Putin is Russia. So I'm here to say that Putin is not Russia. Russia is a huge country with many people in it, with lots of young people who believe in other values and who want things to change in our country. But seriously speaking, this uh, trip is actually a very, uh, has a very symbolic meaning to me. By this visit, I sent a message to the Kremlin, first of all, and to all Russians. Sorry, not for you first, but to <laughs> Russian auditory. My message is that a responsible president should not be pushing relations with a world power towards a deadlock. He should not be afraid to speak openly about problems and threats. Finally, he should not tell lies to his citizens even if he's a former intelligence agent. <laughs> so, let's come back to Russia. There is no problem in Russia other than politics. This is perfectly true for the Russian economy. President Putin is preoccupied with the issue of legal succession. Let me tell you why. This is a fundamental concern for autocrats all over the world. But there is more. Over the past decades, Putin reduced the Russian economy to a private venture of a bunch of people. These people are Putin's most trusted friends and companions, most of them from the Leningrad years. They are also known in Russia like Cooperative Ozera, and uh, now they are among the most powerful um, and most wealthy people of Russia. The famous Panama Papers, and I think you've heard about them, revealed the exact amounts transacted by them. The amounts seem impressive with billions here and billions there. Billions, not millions, once again. The mechanics of massive enrichments is straightforward. Putin's companions rob businessmen of their business. You all remember the Yukos affair, of course, a recent conflict around Bashneft oil company is a fresh example of how things are done in Russia. There are much more small examples when people lose their business or hastily pass it on, on corrupt officials. Or, for example, Putin retainers establish or acquire private companies which are miraculously successful in winning contracts from both the federal and regional governments in Russia. Or the state simply leases out top oil and gas companies to Putin's close friends for uncontrollable enrichment. The result is pathetic and worrisome, of course. Together, the private companies have a turnover that exceeds $40 billion in only 2016 year. 70% of the Russian economy is controlled by state, and it's a fact. The contribution of share of small and medium-sized enterprises to the GDP is stuck at 20%. A recent estimate by the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project estimated the combined wealth of Putin's inner circle at $24 billion. Just think about it. That's why when we talk economy in Russia, we always mean politics. Now I would like to speak to you about economic reforms that are vital for Russia's future as a democracy. The link between a prosperous economy and democratic governance seems to be evident. Experts argue that the richer the nation, the more likely it evolves as democracy. With GDP reaching 20,000 US dollars per capita, a country would almost certainly become a democracy, they say. 
Well, this is not true for Russia, unfortunately. My country attained the level in 2008 and after a short rollback from 2011 year and onwards. Yet there is no more democracy in Russia now than when my father was first elected mayor of St. Petersburg in the 90s years of Russia. Conversely, there is much less democracy in Russia today. My country is drifting towards a strict authoritarian rule. There is nothing new about the fact that economic growth has not brought democracy in Russia. There are three reasons to that. Number one, we are what we repeatedly do. Oil money rained upon oligarchs and bureaucrats, but it also flew in the pockets of ordinary Russians over the last decade. We didn't earn that money, and this is important, through hard work. We need to learn to respect the dignity of work. Just imagine, the Russia's oil and gas exports enriched the country by 2.6 trillion US dollars in 13 years. That's a huge amount. But domestic investment remains steady at 18-20% of GDP a year, a sharp contrast to 31-34% in late Soviet years. What did the country do with the additional 20-25% of GDP, would you ask? What did the country, how did they manage to send this money to something important in Russia? This money went to consumption. Both the petrodollars and the underinvestment made Russian people more affluent, but they compromised the logic of economic growth. Russians naively attributed economic growth to the economic policy of the government, which is totally wrong. Number two, private property. Economy will never thrive if there are no full and immune property rights. In Russia, private property remains unprotected. There are but few people who benefited from the privatization of the 90s. So when the state regained its control over economy, the people cheered the restoration of order. The government easily reestablished its ownership of larger energy companies. It consolidated whole industries within state-owned companies. Private entrepreneurs are constantly being attacked on multiple fronts, as the federal government and state-owned companies and their managers claim businesses, land and money from them. It seems we are almost back to the old days of the Soviet Union. Number three, corruption. And it's also number one and two and all the other numbers. We cannot afford to be politically correct anymore about this issue. Russia is a paradise for corrupt officials. The American government has made it clear in the Kremlin report, any politician in the Kremlin or businessman who is close to it is seen as not clean. When Russia resumed growth in the 2000 year, Business people lined up to bribe officials to get their deals done. I find it a strange kind of generosity that ruins public service, damages statehood and destroys trust. I've joined the political arena so that the bureaucrats can no longer siphon off public funds and steal taxpayers' money. If you want to grasp why economic distortions increased over the last year, just look into the Russian's history. Unlike the United States of America, Russia has always been a paternalistic society. The Russians pay a higher price for it. The interests of the state are considered more important than individual rights, and it always was like that. That is why the state infringes upon human rights. Russia is a great country, but it's especially great in mobilizing its resources, whether to defeat aggressors or to modernize its economy, to catch up. The capacities of Russia are phenomenal. In 1917, the great number of Russians were illiterate. And just think about this. In 1961, we, Russia, sent a man to space. What a huge difference. Its industry has almost collapsed in the 90s year. And now Russia is largely digitalized already. We need just a small correction of this economical mess we're having now in Russia, to put the individuals first ahead of the state. This is what is needed. 
When a country does not protect private property, its state is a step away from intruding into private lives of its citizens. The Russian government today increases its welfare spending because it's afraid of independent people and accomplished people who can support themselves and claim freedom. Market economy and competition set people free. We are enterprising people of the many skills and we can survive and prosper without state support. My message to Kremlin is very simple. Leave us alone to do our jobs and just do yours. The Russian government has increased federal spending too. Yet we have little to show for it. Russia's economy is highly inefficient. Our bridges, roads and airports are few and many times more expensive than the most advanced constructions in the world. At the same time, entrepreneurs are excessively taxed and still 20 million Russians live below poverty line. To sum up, I have a different vision for the Russian economy. I'm first of all a believer. I believe that a liberal, competitive economy can deliver new wealth to my nation, to Russians. We are able to create a new economy based on new technologies where property will be protected by the state. I will be plain and honest with you. Without overhauling the Russian economy, prospects for democracy in Russia are very thin. Now I will share with you my action plan for Russia. The most important difference between my program and the program of Vladimir Putin, which we haven't seen yet, by the way, is that I put the rule of law first. Russia is doomed if there is no rule of law at all. I have no patience for lawlessness and corruption, and if elected, I am determined to build Chinese walls between business and government. All property disputes have to be resolved in fair and open courts. If oligarchs, beneficiaries of the state contracts or government officials have acquired property illegally through diversion of public funds, they will have to defend themselves in court. My plan begins with justice and fairness in courts, which does not exist now in Russia. Only responsible and independent judges can protect private property. Property is sacred, and my country had had enough on, of confiscation, nationalization, collectivization, and even privatization. I stand for a strong state that can uphold basic economic rights and remain inexpensive for the citizens. Russian taxpayers need tax relief. We can afford it is we reduce the state apparatus. Security and efficiency are best guaranteed by predictable foreign policy and economic development, not by uncontrollable, uncontrollable appending on military and state security. Next comes the reform of state corporations. While many liberals want to dismantle and privatize, and privatize them, I propose to replace their management and open the jobs to experienced and accomplished managers, both Russian and foreign. Russia was not afraid of foreigners who came to Russia to reform its military in the 17th century, for example, to build first modern industrial facilities under Peter the Great, nor to promote science and research under Catherine the Great. Why should the new Russia be afraid of them today? I am going to work to abolish restrictions on private and foreign investment into Russia that have become a signature of Putin's economic policy. It's time to open strategic industries and strategic enterprises for foreign investment, to let private companies to build new roads, new railroads, runways and pipelines, and to own them. This is also very important. On the state corporations, I will get away with their special interests and preferences illegally granted to them. I am a believer, and at the same time, I am a Jeffersonian. I believe the solution lay with the individual. I believe in the spirit of private enterprise, and I see Russia as a country fooled not by petrodollars, but by private initiative of people who live there, from whatever part of the world they may come. We will foster new enterprises and new industries instead of fighting for control over those that already exist. Our exports dramatically depend on oil and gas now. We sell more raw resources than the Soviet Union now. 
We have lost two decades and failed to harness new technologies. To catch up, we need to lower taxes on new production facilities built in Russia for the least 10 years. On the property rights, I will learn from you actually. I strongly advocate a Beidol Act for Russia. This revolutionary piece of legislation overwhelmed the economy when it allowed inventors to pursue ownership of inventions made with federal funding. We will allow the Russians to benefit commercially from their inventions. Last but not least, Russian economy has another great shortcoming. Where are most industrial facilities are located? Deep in the middle of our country. In the middle actually of nowhere. If you have ever seen the map of Russia, <laughs> you can imagine where this nowhere is. In many places life is difficult there and very uncomfortable. Things have to change. Russian economy needs to expand to coastal regions, to the Pacific, to the Baltic and to the Black Sea region. Unlike the US and China, Russia has always neglected its coastal regions, and I don't know for what reason actually. More economic freedoms should be granted to these regions. They should be allowed to thrive on globalization and coastal economy, to accommodate foreign investment, both private and public. I know that today, in this uh, big hall, there are a lot of Russians in this room. I think I'm right, and I've heard a lot of <laughs> Russian voices and people who speak Russian. And actually, I want to address to you now. As a pre presidential candidate, I want to tell you that I'm very proud of you and of all of your accomplishments here. I know that there are a lot of accomplishments here. But also, I'm very sad that Russia lost you because this is a huge loss. And this loss is felt actually everywhere now in Russia, in all kinds of businesses, in science, in hospitals, in government, everywhere we can feel this loss of people, of talented people, of passionate people, of people who love to work, who come here because they don't have good uh, situation to work in for Russia. I hope that with a change of leadership in Russia, you all will realize that your help is so invaluable and that we need it so much in transforming our great country so that you could come back. So I hope this day would come and many people, many Russian people, would find it suitable and comfortable for them to come back to Russia to build and transform this new democratic country. Thank you very much. And now I'm, I'm ready for your questions. Thank you very much. I have uh, a few to start off with. Thank you for a really uh, terrific uh, diagnosis of what ails Russia and a very clearly uh, a laid out uh, plan. Um, I wanted to, to start off with uh, a simple question. Um, we're very glad that you're here. We're very honored that you're here. Um, it's tremendous to see so many people, so many uh, uh, new faces here uh, at the Harriman. But why are you here? Uh, well, there's an election coming up in Russia uh, pretty soon. Uh, it's unusual for a candidate to be uh, outside the country so close to an election. So why are you here? Well, first of all, I'm an unusual candidate, so that's an obvious answer. Uh, but uh, really, I actually answered it in my speech, but my, um, my message is, first of all, I'm sorry, guys, but I will tell you the truth, is for Russians, it's not for Americans. My, my message to my Russian auditory is that I, I'm not afraid to go to America in the times of these uh, so bad relations, when all the propagandistic TV in Russia is now showing the pictures of me being here and saying she went to her master's for salary and all this, <laughs> this absurd things they always say on our propagandistic TV. 
So I'm not afraid of it. I want to show there is no fear because there is a vicious circle with opposition in Russia. They so much put this cliche that if you meet a foreigner, if a, an opposition leader is photographed with a foreigner, it's already something we can show against him on the TV and show that those people are traitors of their uh, country and they're not patriots. That's a vicious circle. That's not normal. I don't want to come back to the Soviet times when meeting and connecting with a foreigner was something you should be ashamed of and something you should be frightened of. I want to show that I will be another type of politician. I want to open Russia to the world. I want to embrace European values. I want to embrace Western values. And I want to show a new vector of international relations of Russia. And my vector is friendship, cooperation, and reset of our relations with America. Excellent. Uh, thanks. Um, now I have a question that I think is on the minds probably of a lot of people in the room. Um, and when you're running for, the, the Kremlin has not been known to make it very difficult for opposition candidates to even prevent them from running. Uh, you are uh, running and you face a problem of credibility in that even when you criticize the Kremlin, even when you go to Chechnya, uh, to protest against human rights abuses there. Skeptical people see that and say, oh, well, of course, this is all, she's just a technical candidate. She's there to distract people away from Navalny, distract uh, away from other uh, candidates, just to raise turnout because we're very concerned about uh, low turnout in this election. And it puts you in a very difficult situation. So um, how do you demonstrate that you are truly independent of the Kremlin to try to please those skeptics. Or maybe you don't have to, but I'm sure you've thought about this and have been asked this before and just want to hear your response. Thank well, you. first of all, I think whatever words you can say, they will never be trusted because, you know, we tell lies and we tell the truth with the same words. So the only thing you can change the attitude and win this credibility of people is what you do. You know, in Russia we have a joke because there's so much conspiracy in Russia about everything because we really live in such a authoritarian uh, circumstances, uh, authoritarian regime. And there's always, you know, this, this is a field for many conspiracy theories. So there is a joke that we are all, meaning Russians, are a Kremlin project because this is said about anyone you know if if you do anything you will be called Kremlin's project anyway so I mean the only thing you can do is go forward and just do your best and show what you are standing for because let's be logical it's an absurd thing calling me you know a Muppet of Putin or a Kremlin project but even if it were true, then I'm a good project, not a bad project, <laughs> if I'm criticizing Putin all the time and doing it really harsh with no censorship and without, you know, saying something uh, where there is a line where I cannot say something. So, now not joking but telling, you know, real things, I think that most important is to show the result, is to show that opposition in Russia is strong and that we can show some results on those elections. That's the only thing we can do right now. There is no other way. And that's actually why I'm here. And of course, without the permission of uh, Kremlin, you cannot be shown on Russian TV, which is governmental. You cannot be accepted to election because even though I gather those signatures myself, they can always think of something why they don't accept them. We all should be realistic about this. This is true. But my plan is about underestimating. You know, in a totalitarian regime, the only way to win is to be underestimated. Look what they do with people who they overestimate or whom they really afraid of. 
they put them to prison. They, you know, do everything for them to be marginalized and not take part in politics. So the only thing to, you know, to go on and to think of another plan is to be someone underestimated with a burden of show business past, which they always put on my face on propagandistic TV, and just say, okay, let this blonde girl go. We need, you know, clear elections so we won't think of any, you know, lawsuits for her. So let it be like that. Okay. These are the rules of authoritarian regimes. But what I do, I fight for freedom of speech. I speak to millions of people on TV every day, which have never heard something like this before. For them, it's a real shock, because they do not use internet, they do not know what is independent channels are, and for them, it's a real new information that can change their way of thinking. And if, you know, 10 people out of those millions start thinking differently, that's already a change. That's a start for a change. Great. Um, can uh, I ask you a little bit about the upcoming election? So um, what are you expecting to happen and what are you looking for? Uh, for example, are there some number in terms of turnout or vote share for Putin that you would think would be a signal of his strength or his weakness? Or if there's a lot of falsification, would that be also a sign of, you know, potential weakness? And, and what are you expecting for your own result? What, what will you be happy with? If you say, uh, I beat Irina Hakamada, who got 4% in 2004, and I'll have the most votes ever for a woman. Just, I'm just interested in what you're looking for in these elections coming up, and what do you think will be important lessons that we might be able to draw from that? Look, I think those elections cannot be important, nor for me, nor for anyone else, because it's not, for me, a real election. So. Uh, you know, any talk of some percentage is absurd because you should all understand it's totally untransparent system. We don't know how they count those percentage. Even if we put all the vigilance on the places where people put ballots in, mm. we don't know the whole process. I mean, we don't know what happens later on. All the people are connected to Putin. It's a strong hierarchy which goes to one man. So, I mean... Like, how can we decide? Maybe it's just three of them, Ella Pamphilova, mm -hmm. Kirianka, mm -hmm. and someone else, or Putin himself, sitting together in a room, thinking, okay, mm -hmm. how much you will think I should win on those elections? 72% mm -hmm. or 75? No, 75 is too much. Let's do it 72. <laughs> okay. So we don't know. Maybe it's like this. We have no ability, actually, to change. It's not a transparent system at all. So... In this respect, the result is not important for me. They can really, you know, we cannot control all the process. What we can control is to make, you know, this thing moving. We can show that there are many people who disagree. And another thing we can do on those elections, and that's a rare chance, and that's why actually I went on them, is a chance of telling things on federal TV during debates, during the time that by constitution they are obliged to give to you. And they cannot change it right now. It will look ridiculous if all the other candidates get their time and just one they don't let them do it. So this is a chance just to speak to a huge country. So for me, presidential elections is the beginning and then the real goal is not the percentage, which we don't know we, which would be on those elections. It's the creating of a party, of some movement that can go to parliament to really try to change things. Because we already saw it on, on elections of municipals, deputies in uh, Moscow, that people are not voting for United Russia's party candidates. They hate this party, actually, and this all the polls showed, uh, you know, and all, all the results showed. So this is my goal, to create a movement, to, to unite people, to show that there is a coalition in oppositional movement, and to go on. 
So this is what I am up to. Great. Um, you, you've talked about, um, after the elections, running for the Duma. Yes, Parliament. A, a, yeah, for, Russian for Parliament. Parliament. For Russian Parliament. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, what you think that would look like? Would this be your own party? Um, would you join an established party? Um, we all know that the Russian uh, opposition historically has not been very unified. Uh, and that's within, true. That's yeah. the Myakaskazna. I know, yeah. Um, uh, so how uh, do you think in the future the, the Russian opposition can uh, unify more successfully than they've done in the past? Well, that's a good question because, uh, you know, being Democrats, it's always uh, more complicated than with dictators. There you don't have any problems. There is one person who tells others what to do. With people of democratic views, it's always different. Mm -hmm. Each one has his own platform, his way of changes in Russia. Uh, we always speak with each other, we do not agree, and, you know, each has his own way. So this is what actually goes on now and goes on every elections. The only way to change it is uh, to build something big and strong so that others won't have other alternative than just to be part of that. Uh, for this reason, you have first to grow stronger than all others, much mm -hmm. evidently. Mm -hmm. So that's actually the purpose of this movement, which I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hope it will be created on the platform of Citizens Initiative Party, from which I'm mm -hmm. going to mm -hmm. those elections. It's a party with whom I already have a preliminary agreement to, the, to do this after elections. We're already discussing the format of, uh, of how it is possible, but this is a good platform for, mm -hmm. to begin with, and it's a party with, uh, with views we mm -hmm. share together about democracy, about liberal values. Andrei Nichayev is also mm -hmm. a very respected person, a famous economist in Russia. So mm -hmm. this is the, the kind of the party that in future mm -hmm. can work out as a big um, movement. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your relationship with the Mr. Navalny? Uh, I know this question was going to be asked, so I might as well ask it. Um, you know, I saw the interview that you did with him on TV Rain. It was great. Uh, it was both uh, uh, parties uh, defending their positions uh, quite well. Um, and you came to visit him after you were in Chechnya. Uh, so it seems like you're almost like frenemies in the sense that you are both friends and, and competitors at the same time, two strong personalities with very strong uh, uh, visions, but you know, with a lot in common as well. Uh, could you talk about how that relationship might evolve or what the relationship is like now? Well, um, Alexei Navalny, uh, you were right, for many years we were together and on those first uh, position meetings we were together, on those demonstrations. But sometimes it happens like this uh, mm -hmm. in Russia uh, mm -hmm. and in other countries too, that uh, your views on some particular subjects, mm -hmm. they're not the same. And you know, maybe I would uh, say something, uh, how to say, sexist in a way, but with men it's always <laughs> like this in Russia. They always want to be the head of everything and they, they don't want any compromise taking this territory. Well, I don't agree because I spoke with Alexei a lot of times before I took my decision and uh, my position was that, look, let's think over another plan if you are not if you will not be led to those elections because you want to take part mm -hmm. we will do everything so that they register you but if they don't which to my mind was quite obvious they wouldn't do it because they created a fake lawsuits not to let him to the elections then what do we have we cannot just you know do nothing and sit at home if they don't let you you know, if we are a team, like in football, you know, if one player, even if he's the strongest one, if he's taken off the field or there is a trauma, the play must go on. There should be another person going and doing this. 
because mathematically, and Navalny knows this for sure, mathematically, once again, boycott is a bad idea. I explained it thousands of times. I wrote many articles about them, and not only me. Mr. Hodorkovsky, with whom I share those opinions, and we are always, you know, now talking, and he, I'm very grateful to him for his support, and with many other leaders of opposition and many other experts, they all agree that in a country without a minimal turnout on the elections, there's no sense of boycotting them. Because you should understand, if 10 people will come to the elections, only 10, Putin will still be legitimately uh, chosen as a president. But then it will be 100% for Putin. If three people out of this 10 will come against, that will mm -hmm. give much lesser votes for mm -hmm. Putin. So this is the goal. And actually, Alexei Navalny always shared this point of view. If you see any videos with him before those elections, it was always the position, which is actually a rational position, Go and vote against Putin for any candidate. Go and vote against United uh, Russia Party for any party, but not United Ru Russia. And that was like, oh, now I will think <laughs> about my little baby left at home. <laughs> uh, so do it. Just uh, go and vote for anyone, but not him. This will lessen their votes and them giving them a symbol that we do not agree. But now look what's happened. When he's not let, he says no. Now everyone stays at home. That's not fair. It's like we are not even fighting now for winning. Nor of us could win, nor me, nor Alexei Navalny. So why count chickens before they hatch? Ha before they hatch, thank you. <laughs> I mean, none of us, Putin always wins on Russian elections, you know? It's like uh, in Russia, we always say there are three things we cannot choose. We cannot choose our parents, we cannot choose our gender, and we cannot choose a president. <laughs> so, like, why argue about that now when we are both, you know, not gonna win anyway, even if he would let be there? So, Okay, he held his position strong. You can't transfer the votes, nor to me, nor to anyone else. We had different options. That was not only my uh, candidature that I was talking with him about. Okay, but anyway, we should go on. Because staying at home is a bad position. It will only give Putin more votes. It will be easier for them to, um, to fake the turnout. Because if people don't come, it's easier to say that they came. And it's a known fact. Everyone knows that. All the experts you can ask about. So that's how we divide it for a time. But I hope after the elections, mm -hmm. when you know, the situation will become smoother and uh, we will be able to talk again, and maybe then we will be together at this you know, party building, which mm -hmm. is important for a position. I'm glad you asked about, uh, or you mentioned the next period because, uh, you know, according to the Constitution, this is um, likely to be President Putin's last term. Uh, how do you see the dynamics of the potential, because, you know, the Constitution could be changed, of course, and he, he could stay on, but provided that this is uh, the last term, uh, how do you see this transfer uh, of power taking place, and does this give you an opportunity uh, to uh, challenge uh, whoever might be uh, Mr. Putin's chosen uh, successor? Well, that depends on whom he chooses. That mm -hmm. actually makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And yes, we should be realists about this. I mean, we want Putin to leave, but he doesn't. So we have to be <laughs> realistic about mm -hmm. the things we can do next. The good answer, very heroic answer, which we have, mm -hmm. let's make a revolution. But we cannot. I mean, by all the means we cannot. People do not want that. Lots of people don't share those views, even in opposition. Secondary, their position now on the streets is much lesser than it was in 2011 when I was there. Because when we first went out, it was 150,000 people on the streets. Now, 
with all the repression machine, with all the po poli uh, police on the streets, with all the arrests, there are several thousands on the street. It's, it's, you know, it's a huge change. So let's be realistic what we can do during those six years. The best idea is to form a soft power within, in the system which we don't like, but there is no other way, to influence Putin, to show that many young people, which is true because mostly our core audience is young Russians for whom it's first time they go to vote. So that we are a power, we do not agree, and it's only more and more people joining us. So you should take into account what we think. And I think that that is a way. Those six years, I hope, will be different from those that were before if we will get a big amount of votes and we will be heard. Secondary, we should uh, do it this way, that if there would be a compromise figure, and I really strongly believe that it will be this, the last six years of Putin, then let's speak about this compromise figure. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it's, for example, someone like Kudrin, this is a discussable mm -hmm. case. If it's someone like Sechin, mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. I don't think this is something worth discussing with the position or with mm -hmm. anyone who wants liberal values in mm -hmm. our country. So that depends. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is actually our goal, to, to influence Putin, to influence the system, to, to come to a liberalization mm -hmm. in this or that form, to make it evident that without it, sooner or later, with any economical problems in Russia, there will be a collapse, a revolution, people on the streets which will be different from us. They will revolt for another kind of things and mm -hmm. much more radical, even much more radical than Alexei Navalny. So no one wants that. Mm -hmm. So let's keep, keep it you know, in this framework of mm -hmm. discussions uh, and the legitimate kind mm -hmm. of influence. I have just a couple more questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, uh, you're a woman running for the presidency uh, of the Russian Federation. Uh, often uh, women candidates play or try to appeal to female voters. Uh, you haven't really done that so much. Is that a, uh, a conscious strategy or is that just, uh, you're just, that's just your natural kind of style? Is this something that you think about? I ask in part because my wife studies gender and politics and she would want me to, to ask this question, so. Uh. Well, that's a good question, thank you for it. Well, first of all, that is true and that is already statistic, all the polls show it to us that I have a, big support of women in Russia, mm -hmm. in our country, 20% more mm -hmm. than men. So women mm -hmm. are supporting me, mm -hmm. and this is something important. But you know, for me, I don't know if I will say it the right way in English, but for me, it always was a bit, you know, humiliating. If you choose a person because of his gender mm -hmm. or his, you know, color of uh, mm -hmm. the skin mm -hmm. or his nationality and not for what he does on how he thinks. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm a woman, I'm mm -hmm. proud of that and I think there are um, many problems mm -hmm. with feminist mm -hmm. movement in Russia and there are many problems to solve for mm -hmm. women in Russia uh, because the, the, the violence that mm -hmm. women face in their homes is huge, mm -hmm. and uh, the salaries they, gay, they get are 30% less than men. And mm -hmm. the, the problem that men in our country tell it openly, they even don't disguise it like here, that they <laughs> more likely to hire a, a man than a woman. They just tell it like this. You know, mm -hmm. one of the businessmen three weeks ago, a very famous businessman in Russia, just put uh, on his Facebook, a kind of um, advertisement for a secretary position that should be not more than 25 years old. Mm -hmm. He put a photo and that she shouldn't be less beautiful than the woman on this photo mm -hmm. and some other stupid things. And no one was shocked. It was not like something when Trump says here about nasty women. No, it was like, mm -hmm. okay, a new advertisement for working in a company. So I have a long way to fight for there. but. I don't want that 
you know, uh, my gender would be more than what I say, what I think, and what I do. Great, thanks. The last qu question I have is, this is your first time running for office on the, well, yes. on the national <laughs> I'm stage. 36, this is actually the <laughs> first time that, I could do that's that. That's right, that's right. And, uh, you know, what, is, what has surprised you? I mean, what were your expectations when you started to run? And what has been the things that really you just didn't expect at all? What has been the shocking things? What have you learned? So. Well, well, first thing that, um, well, it, it will, I will say banalities, but that's how it is, that um, as soon as you start, you know, this competition, mm -hmm. there are no more friends or enemies like before mm -hmm. it was. It's only people, they share someone else's values or not, mm -hmm. they will fight you, even if they agree with you, they will mm -hmm. fight you because it's competition. So, you know, there are no more friends in this, uh, in this kind of mm -hmm. uh, deal. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's a big thing because many of people whom I respect very much and I know they like me and we meet for coffee, we have good mm -hmm. friendships for so many years, but if they have some links with another people from opposition, they will still be attacking mm -hmm. you on their mm -hmm. uh, public opinions, whatever you do. The best thing you do, they attack you. The worst thing you do, they attack you. And it has nothing to do with what you really do, actually. That was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Another thing that really shocked me is, um, but in a, in a good, positive mm -hmm. way, that people really need change all over the Russia. It's not true that these protests are actual only in Moscow or St. Petersburg. It's not true. I've traveled all over Siberia. I've traveled up to Ural. I've traveled to Povolzhia. I've traveled to Caucasus Republic. And everywhere, even where the people are most frightened, there are still people who are always saying, yes, we are for the changes. We don't want this go on and on. Mm -hmm. And many people like this. Many people who know what you do, who support you, and it's all over the country. So we're not alone in that, and this is very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to um, uh, turn the uh, floor over to you. You've all been very patient, and we're very uh, <laughs> glad that you came. What I, what I could ask you to do, though, is if, if you could go to one of the two microphones um, to ask your questions, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. The one request, uh, demand uh, uh, that I have is uh, no monologues. This isn't your audition for Broadway. Um, we have a lot of people that would like to ask questions. Uh, and Ksenia has been very patient. She came right up here uh, on the train from Washington. So if you could say who you are, say your name, uh, and, uh, 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 and, and ask your question. So we'll start over here on the right. And Tim Karoch, Tim Lucia. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to be short. My name is Dennis uh, Denis Saklakov. Um, I, I wanted to ask the following question. Uh, I am a. I used to be a legal professional in in Russia. Um, let's assume we do believe that you do not play a spoil, spoiler for Navalny. I have a very specific question. Why do you not do these two things? That would, in my personal view, open my way to, to say, well, that time I do believe her. How about you sue as a candidate, sue the other gentleman um, who is now holding unlawfully, in my opinion, the position of the president of the Russian Federation. Don't want even to call him by name, you know. Now. Now, how about you sue him for, I would actually sue him for treason, but how about you sue him for, uh, for failing to comply with the requirements of the Russian Constitution, which is supported by, by the ruling of the Supreme Court of 1998 and 2001, consequently, banning a single person to hold the position of the President of the Russian Federation for more than two times, for more than eight years overall. How about you do this? And wait, you only have a very narrow window for, of, of opportunity for that. That would be 
only until the 18th of April that, we can, that you can do it, actually. Because until then, your, your, your right is breached. So how about you do this? And then I would really, I would really also welcome you if you would withdraw your candidature before the very, uh, the very so-called election, because it's so-called. Okay, thank you for your questions. So first of all, as you know, the, the new uh, kind of change which was made in Constitution is saying that it's two times uh, running, padriat. I don't know how to say Not this. Consecutively. Yes, consecutively. which is actually, of course, a new way of, you know, legitimizing Mr. Putin, but, you know, he makes these changes. So, well, uh, you think that this is so important? We will actually discuss it with my lawyers, but you should understand that makes no sense at all uh, because it will never be accomplished. So if you think that this is so important to write this lawsuit, well, actually, it's a good idea. Maybe we would do that, but we all know it will give no result. If you really think that if I'll write to the court, which we don't have independent court in Russia, this is something I'll open your eyes on to. We don't have any courts in Russia. So courts do what Putin says. So I can write to the court, but we all know the answer they, uh, I will get. If you really think that after this they will all get frightened and Putin say, oh yes, if Ksenia with her lawyers wrote to our constitutional court, then maybe I won't go. Yes, she is right about that. So maybe actually we can do, but as far as we, as I know about this issue, this adding about two times padriat, two times running, uh, uh, that, that gave him the opportunity to, to think of Medvedev when we saw it and now go again. So, you know, if it makes that much sense to you, if you promise you will vote for me after this, I will think <laughs> about that for my uh, lawyers. Mm -hmm. Secondary, about withdrawing my uh, candidacy. Well, what's the point of that? I don't understand. I mean, uh, those elections would pass with me or without me, and the only thing I can really change is to put in the spotlight the problems we have in Russia. And I'm really proud that I'm the only person in the Russian Federation now, a public person, a political public person, who says openly that Crimea is Ukrainian by law. I mean, no one says that in Russia. It's a shock to hear something like this. It's a shock to hear that we should take Lenin away from the Red Square. It's a shock for many people. You know, it's a shock to hear that I think that Stalin should be called a killer and not be discussed as an effective manager in Russia. It's a shock to hear about political prisoners and the name of real corruptioners, which I do in any uh, federal um, television when I have time slot there. So I think it's much more important to talk to people through this opportunity than just to lose this opportunity in order to do what? In order again to sit at home? What will we change like this? Being a politologist, I studied international relations and I got a magister uh, degree in politology. I can give you a number of examples of the overturning elections, so-called, when everyone awaited one result and then suddenly appeared another result on the elections. Pinochet referendum is a good example of overturning elections. But I cannot name you a single example when people stayed at home and they changed something. Well, maybe Trump elections are a good example of that. <laughs> but that's, that's not actually, we're not sure if those changes are too better. So let's yeah. see. I have to say that this, as a political scientist, this warms my heart to hear her um, talking about you know, these electoral dynamics and uh, in your presentation as well, talking about the resource curse and all the things. Uh, yeah, but I, I want to make official too, statement. Too Although good. I'm Russia in uh, America now, by saying this about Trump, I'm not meddling into <laughs> Americans' elections. <laughs> Max. Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Max Ahalabang, I'm a reporter for Fortune, a graduate of Harvard University. 
Um, I, uh, so you, you started, as far as I understand, your candidacy, um, calling yourself again. Sorry, sorry, my English yeah. is a bit rusty for no. that kind of, um, a little bit. British yeah. accent, it's so <laughs> slow down. Yeah. Um, you started your candidacy uh, calling yourself an against all mm -hmm. candidate, right? rallying everyone who's against uh, the candidate against uh, And now, as, as you've just reeled off, you, you have a list of, of very controversial policies saying that the Crimea is leading by the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. you should take that but square, etc. I'm wondering how you, you sort of combine these two. It seems that the, the people who would vote for, for you as an against all candidate would also be put off by things like that. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, against all, uh, first of all, comes from um, the, the idea which we had in Russia for many years that there was, I don't know, I think in American elections that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We had a special um, strochka, I don't know, no, how to, uh, uh, a, a line, line, a line yeah. in the mm -hmm. an, any bulletin mm -hmm. on any elections mm -hmm. to vote against all. And presumably, if people vote against all, all the candidates have to withdraw and they were, wouldn't be let for another elections because that means people don't want those people to, to be part of that. Then uh, this line began gathering lots of votes and then it was cancelled be because people started to be afraid that one day really all the people would come and say, go away, we don't want any of you. So that was the idea of against all. But the things I say... I think it's the beginning of very important discussions. And I don't want to be a populist. I'm really saying what I think about this. Even if I don't share w this view with uh, most of the people of Russia, well, that's like this now, but it will change because most people of Russia really support Putin now. There are lots of people like that. And that's also a fact. And this is not fake. Elections are fake. But real people really support Putin because their minds are brainwashed, they watch only one kind of information they get, and they really start thinking like that. And we see it in our independent polls too. So this is a beginning of those changes. They don't go fast, unfortunately. That's a slow process. But I'm, think, I'm saying what I think. So if I think that LGBT should not be put to prison if they're LGBT, and there are many people in Russia who do support this idea, if I really think they have the same rights as we do, then I say it out loud, and I don't care if someone doesn't like it, because I want to people to start thinking another way of those things, about Crimea, about communism, about many, many other things. And this is important to me, and I want it to be important for millions of Russians. Uh, please, as a, as a Harriman alumni, I can grant you a, a very brief follow-up question. <laughs> I, I guess I'm wondering if, if the, you know, a lot of people who criticize your candidacy say that it's, um, it's to put a sort of a caricature of what the opposition is, right, thing as much as And um, for people who are really unhappy in their economic situation, but at the same time, their only option of voting someone who's against them is also for someone who like, wants to legalize marijuana. Um, does, does, do, do, do you not worry that that plays into that line? Well, uh, I am saying what I really think I should say. And uh, my voters, my core audience are young people in Russia. So I actually do what I need uh, f to have their support if that's the way I think and it has, you know, it's not intruding the way I think. Uh, this point you're making, and it's also highly disputed, is about a huge epidemic in Russia with heavy drugs among young people. I don't know if you know this problem, but that's really a huge epidemic, you can't call it differently, in many big cities where people, where youngsters use very cheap and very harsh drugs, uh, chemical drugs, and uh, it happens so, they don't drink, you know, vodka or something, what usually Russians do to be crazy, you know. So. Yes, that's another culture, and I really don't think, uh, and many experts agree with me, and statistics agree, that in the countries where this uh, light forms of marijuana is, uh, um, how to say, legal. is legal, mm -hmm. the number of those drugs uh, becomes less, and for young people, it's really, you know, a big problem now in Russia. 
So my program is about, you know, the needs of those young people. And there are different things. There are 123 things. And believe me, marijuana is not, you know, the most important <laughs> thing there. <laughs> but I like you pay the attention. Look, now you already know <laughs> something about the program. Maybe <laughs> next time you'll vote for me after the lessons. Yeah, thank you very uh, much. Sergey Tereshenko, Slavic Department, Columbia University. Uh, my question is, um, what do you imagine an alternative to a charismatic leader? Do you think that you have to beat Putin with uh, a softer version of Putin, or is there any other way of uh, sourcing power in Russia? And will it be possible without changing the myth of Russia, of nationalism and its history, because Putin usually refers to history, uh, the thing you did actually today too, uh, you know, just to explain something today um, that happened like 1,000 years ago, I don't know. And also, the, 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 the uh, you know, like uh, the follow-up to this question is, uh, you mentioned uh, citizen initiative, uh, but how do you imagine the centralization of power? Do you support unions? And uh, uh, how can a citizen build a grassroots uh, initiative in Russia? Can you help with your uh, campaign uh, to promote these ideas? Two easy questions, right? <laughs> okay. No. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, about the party, it's it's a name for the party, uh, Citizens Initiative. So I hope that this party, which already exists, and there are many people already taking part in that and helping me on the elections too, will become bigger, greater, and will begin this process of changes in the country. So I think it is in itself a mechanism to make those people be involved in politics and try to change the situation. Because, you know, now we see that all the uh, protests started with elections of Duma, of, uh, of Parliament of Russia, which were fake at all. So this Duma is not, a le uh, not legitimate. And I really think, and all the experts agree with me, that next Duma will be much more oppositional anyway. So let's take this niche. Let's just come and get those places. And this will be the real legislation process we can start. You know, putting away those stupid laws they created for those years and creating new laws that will help us. So um, the first question, as I understood, maybe you repeat me because I didn't get it quite well, was about uh, the changes, uh, if they can be made by someone softer or um, more, uh, so to say, totalitarian type, uh, type of uh, leader, yes? Uh, I would say w whether you see any kind of um, alternative to a charismatic leader, someone who would uh, be a, a weak leader, you know, that you like decentralize power well, I think that here we need, and this is actually a very hard thing to do, we need someone like Roosevelt in a way. We need a person who can take the power, would be charismatic enough to take the power, but then to be big enough as an individual to let the power off. And that's the most difficult part, because when you get this power in Russia, you know, <laughs> you don't want to get it away because anyone who becomes the ruling person in Russia mm -hmm. automatically throughout centuries, no matter if we are talking about communists or Democrats or anyone else, they all become a Tsar. Mm -hmm. And that's always like this. Just look what we had. You're talking about history, but that's true. We hated Tsar, revolutionaries hated Tsar, they made a revolution, what we got? We got a new Tsar. We not, got new Tsars on, in the communist parties for all those years. Then we didn't like communists, Democrats came. What we got? Again, a Tsar and a person whom the Tsar took to the people and said, now he will be the, our Tsar. So we're always having Tsars. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a problem for many people about opposition leaders. Because if you yield for your personal power so much, not for the common values of the people, but for your own power, then what's the guarantee that when you will come to power, you won't be a Tsar too? Of course you will if you're so authoritarian and so insistent that only you and you are the only monopolist on the opposition. So 
I'm really against that. And to avoid even this temptation of power, my proposition from the very beginning is a proposition of a parliamentary republic, which is a mechanism just to, to get rid of those talks of presidential powers. Unfortunately, to my mind, Russia is not ready as a presidential republic. It will always be a Tsar in the rule of presidential republic. So let's switch to the parliamentary model with lots of actors which will have to deal with each other, making, you know, and creating laws and system. Uh, when you mind, it was, uh, it was the first question, and you still answer it uh, like from the position of top down, you know? from the parliament, from the president perspective, but I'm interested in uh, whether you can, with your campaign, as you already said that it's probably, it's gonna fail, whether you can teach people to get initiative in their hand and fight with the strong leader by grassroots organizations and unions and so forth. Well, I'll try to, it's a long way. I don't know whether I could teach them to do that, but I will try and I'm trying to do this. I'm forming these discussions and putting them up to agenda. So, mm -hmm. well, we will see. I'm trying, <laughs> trying my best. Thank you. Yes, I'm always interested in these questions when they say, <clears throat> in Ru Russia, they want a strong leader. And I'm still looking for the country that says, no, we want a weak leader, right? I mean, even in democratic countries, you know, <laughs> you want your leaders to, to, you know, to be strong and have strong views. So, um, question over here. Thank you. Good evening, Senya. My name is Pavel Pavlichuk. I'm a Columbia University graduate student. And while I appreciate a lot of things that you said today, uh, the main reason why I'll be voting for you in March is that you are the only candidate that openly supports LGBTQI rights in Russia. And I have a few questions about that. Why do you think uh, Vladimir Putin oppresses gays so much in Russia? Uh, when do you think same-sex marriages will be allowed in Russia, if ever? And um, how do we, in general, and possibly change the whole Russian culture and Russian people to make them less out of power? Well, I will tell you the problem with those questions. There is only one problem. That, you know, we were speaking about so many important and different things here. And you see there, well, if you turn, there are some TVs, some of them are Russian, as I know, and they will only show this episode. This is what always <laughs> <Yeah>. happens. <laughs> you know, this is how the propaganda work. We can talk about economy, about 20% only of uh, private businesses in Russia. We can talk about future and about, you know, parliamentary republic, but they are only waiting for this question to be discussed, and then they put it on central TV. But I'm not afraid again, so uh, this is my position, and uh, I, uh, I think it's really important. So first of all, why Putin is doing this? I actually don't think that he himself, you know, sits down with his people and say, now let's do again something against LGBT, let's discuss them. No, it's just the atmosphere. When you're about all this conservative agenda, you need to, to more hatred to be developed upon different kind of people who are not like you. You need, this is the only mechanism uh, to keep your electorate united is to keep them united against someone who is not like them. So there are not so much people to hate around in Russia. And some are chosen by principle of LGBT movement or by principle of nationality or something else, of being from other countries, like Americans now, they are also in this role. Ukrainians, unfortunately, are in this role now. Banderovci, so to say. So it's just a search for someone to hate. And this is actually what we have to fight about, because Russia, Russian people are very kind. It's a kind nation, but Everything that is done about with us is this hypnosis of hatred which comes into every home through TV. 
every day we only see how we should hate someone, how we are surrounded by enemies. And this is the atmosphere in which we live in. And of course, in this atmosphere, it's impossible to predict when all the people will have the same rights. Never, because it's not suitable. What is suitable, unfortunately, for modern Russia is to find people whom they can hate. And intolerance only grows bigger and bigger. And I think this is a huge mistake of Mr. Putin and all these authorities. Because once this hatred will turn its face on them, and then it will be a real problem. Thank you. My name is Vigen Aharonian. I'm an alumni of Columbia as well. Um, I'm going to ask you a more professional question about relations with NATO. Before I ask though, I, I want to acknowledge your extreme bravery to step into all this and your dignity, how you handle those Chechen guys. I think honesty, bravery, and dignity in itself already is a huge change in Russian politics. And actually, I know you like reading books. I hope that you will find time to read at least a couple of chapters from this book. This is on, it's called Shambhala, the Sacred Path of the Warrior. It is about how to build an enlightened society having strong mind, steady character, and dignity, and Thank confidence. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the question is, uh, recently you gave an interview to Vladimir Posner, and he brought up this historic fact, I guess, that in the 90s when Boris Yeltsin came to the West with open arms and heart, uh, West didn't use the opportunity to really include Russia in, in the Western society, and instead extended it further to the East. And so I don't necessarily agree, but uh, the question is about the future. How do you think Russia should build its, relate to NATO, European Union perhaps as well, but NATO in particular? If you are a president, how would you build those relations? Yes, thank you for your question. This is what I uh, always uh, say and in my program too. Russia is the biggest European nation. We are Europeans, we are not Asians. And the big problem is that um, America and uh, European Union is kind of at one point decided you know, to keep a little bit of a distance with Russia because you know with those crazy Russians you never know what they do and how let's just keep them not you know, really be enemies with them but let's keep them on, on a hands kind of distance. This is not the right kind of thing to do from any case and in here and for Russians because we are a huge country with nuclear weapon and with people who have their pride, who were imperial country before and who have still this <coughs> feeling and dream of becoming great imperial again. So it's not the right idea to just leave them with a distance because what we have now is also the result of it. It's the more authoritarian regime than it could be. The only good way is not to keep Russians out, is to keep Russians in. That means to embrace Russia with all the European and American institutions, the West institutions, to, to become united, which would be good for both parties. It's a win-win situation. It's the only situation in which you, on the West will feel safe about Russia and its regime, its democracy, and we Russians will also feel ourselves part of this big European society. And I really believe that's the only way to deal. The way we went now, this way of Cold War again, you know, all, all these bad relations, is not a good way to both countries. It, it will lead us to nothing, to conflicts and to, to wars maybe, and this is not what we all want. 
So my idea is that in future Russia should become part of European Union. Maybe it's a long way to go, but look what happens with Brexit and with Great Britain now. Why cannot Russia as Great Britain or Norway become a secondary circle of European Union, maybe not like inside, but on the first perimeter with Great Britain. That's my idea, and that will be quite <coughs> logical, and this is quite realistic kind of view, but that will be really a step towards Europeanization of Russia, because otherwise, if we will be left to Asia, there will be nothing good for Europe or America, nor for Russians, in my point of view. NATO is also this kind of an example. Why not stop fighting about the borders of NATO, but have at least steps towards uniting within those structures or with other structures of um, safety in, uh, in the world? So this is the right way, and this is the only way how the country can be uh, secured and inside and on outside. Uh, so this is my policy, and I really want Russia to become part of this Western civilization as it always used to be. We are, we are the same in this respect. We are not... Asian nation, we are Europeans, and that's obvious. All our history is united. So keeping us, you know, somewhere on the backyard is not an idea. You can't keep on a backyard the biggest, one of the biggest countries in the world. You can't keep in a backyard a nuclear country. <coughs> we have examples what comes out of it. Nothing good for anyone. Thank you. You go uh, good evening, Ksenia. My name is Igor Lazarev. Uh, I'm finishing up my dissertation here. Uh, my dissertation is on Chechnya, and I spent a lot of time there. And first of all, I want to thank you for uh, your public action in support for Ayub Titiev, uh, the human rights fighter who was recently detained in Chechnya. Uh, my question uh, is about elections. Um, from the fact that your participation to some extent helps uh, the Kremlin to legitimize elections, a lot of questions about being a spoiler or uh, being a puppet, but uh, there is a other side of the coin that at this point, uh, because of your participation uh, increased legitimacy, you have some leverage, potential leverage over Kremlin. Uh, and in, uh, in this regard, I want to ask you if you plan to do any kind of coordination with uh, other liberal candidate Yevlinsky or communist candidate Grudinin, and for example, agree on some strategies of like how can you leverage this position that your participation in elections is important for Kremlin at this point. Because if you, for example, threaten to withdraw or do not recognize the results of elections, you can actually demand something from Kremlin. Like one thing, but this really the, the thing that's really important for you. So my question is, what if in the in the scenario you would agree on things like that, what would be this like one thing that you would want to demand from Kremlin? Uh, and, you know, in case they won't do it, you would either withdraw or do not recognize the results. Is there such, like, one important, urgent issue? Thank you. Well, I don't have uh, those kind of talks uh, so that I could demand something. But if we live in a kind of imaginary world where this kind of talk could possibly be, then there is one thing for which I will do merely everything. Uh, this is the lives of political prisoners. So if this would be the case, like if tomorrow someone from Kremlin would say, okay, we will let out Oyub Titiev or Alek Navalny or Sinsov or anyone else from the list about which I'm talking a lot, Igor Rudnikov or many, many others, then there would be no discussions because this is much more important. Nor one day in prison of those people who should not be put there are worth my campaign or anyone's campaign. So this deal I will be ready to do immediately and just this may be also a signal to the Kremlin now if it's some, somewhere will be shown. Mm -hmm. So this is something, this is all I have to say about that. Great, thank you. Um, question over here, please. Good evening. 
My name is Yulia Lapina. I'm a graduate student at New York University. And you mentioned in your speech that you, your campaign, you want to highlight the problems of the Russian Federation in your campaign. And I think we can all agree that one of the biggest problems is human rights violation. So you also mentioned that in order to address human rights violation, the state should put individuals before the actual state. So since this is likely not going to be the scenario in the current and the next administration, my question is, how would you address this problem? The problem of human rights, you the mean? The problem of human rights violations. What would, what would be a strategy to do something, improve them somehow? Well, uh, I think that putting in a spotlight, this is actually my idea, is already a very effective way of influencing things. So just look at this. We started a huge campaign about uh, uh, Yuri uh, Dmitriev, who was uh, put uh, to prison, uh, also unfairly of the made-up case. Many people in Russia and me and others started this public campaign that it was unfair. And in the end, we all, you know, united with this media support, with this spotlight support. We did something that in the end resulted in what Dmitriev is now sleeping home in his bed. I went to Chechnya to talk about Titiev. You know, after, as, as I know, you know, the advocate um, had easier way of visiting. Uh, they, now it's much more uh, difficult to do something with Titiv because everyone knows this case already. It's not so easy just for him to disappear somewhere in Chechnya like many other people disappear there. So this media support is one of the very important tools in the country where human rights are abused. So this is actually my goal, is to put into the spotlight those issues so that it will preserve people from being attacked from the state. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. <coughs> we can take a, a few more questions. You, you doing yes, yes. Well, well, I, I think everyone is tired of me already, no, but that, if you that, 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 still... That. <laughs> Um, awesome. Good evening. Um, my name is Alexandra Sofina. I'm a third year pre-med student at Columbia University. And my question won't be directly re related to politics, but it will address education and opportunities for individuals like me who are pursuing a career and are at this stage in, in their lives. So um, we know that the Soviet education system was always perceived to be one of the most rigorous However, in recent decades, um, more and more individuals have been studying and sending their children to study abroad. Um, so how would you say that the current Russian system compares to the Western system? And um, is there anything that can be implemented to better it? And further opportunities for individuals? Thank you. Age? Thank you very much. Educational reform is one of the core reforms of my program, and this is one of the important issues. Because, yes, the, the Soviet times have passed away already, and the system that w edu of education that worked then does not work now. We implemented new rules, which are like, so to say, um, they are uh, reflecting uh, the uh, Western system of education, but it didn't become ours. And the way the people are taught, the salaries the teachers are get, do not make it easier for education to develop. And actually, uh, you know, rich people who send their children abroad to study is a result of the breakage of this uh, educational system. So we need an educational reform. This is for sure something very important. And one of the first things that should be done is revision of the budget. You know, the budget should not be around 20% uh, for military uh, things and only 2% for education. That's, you know, that's ridiculous. Uh, we need uh, much higher budgets for educational reforms, for the salaries of teachers, and for the whole revision of the system which is now existing in Russia. That's a huge and very long process, 
But um, I think it's one of the most important things that should be done in New Russia. Mm. Yes, Thank you. And, and as someone who runs an institute at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, I'm all in favor of raising yeah. spending in Russia on education. So that's, next that's question. That's true. <laughs> Uh, hello, Ksenia. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Irina Mazai. Uh, I'm a current uh, Columbia student, but last year I worked in the federal Russian government. So uh, my question is about your movement, uh, your new movement. Uh, but um, I would like to uh, make a little introduction. Uh, not many people, I suppose, uh, uh, remember that in 2006 you already had a political movement call uh, all uh, free Russians or all free, uh, correct me if, I'm, uh, uh, if, if, if it is correct. Uh, and actually I wanted to join to your movement, but because it was movement uh, which, are located, uh, which are located in uh, Moscow, uh, and I'm, from, I'm not from Moscow, I'm from Yaroslav, I joined to political movements which were supported by Russian politician like uh, Vladislav Surkov and uh, like uh, other politician. And my question is about your new movement. What uh, will be dif the difference between this uh, previous one you undertake uh, and the new one? Uh, the second question here is uh, why uh, until today, since 2006, you haven't undertake any steps uh, in this direction in uh, public politics? And uh, the final question is for people like me who worked uh, in government, who was in uh, uh, different movements, uh, who supported actually uh, uh, President Putin, uh, will be eligible to join to your new movement or it will be the black mark for you, uh, for these people? Thank you. Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Well, first of all, you really have a good memory and now I know how a long life I lived. <laughs> I really had, well, I wouldn't call it a movement because it was like a three-action three mm. kind of movement which we did only to, to promote those actions. It was about urbanization in Moscow and uh, it really existed. It was named Vsesvabodne, something like this. Uh, it wasn't like a political uh, party, but... Yes, I had this kind of experience too many years ago, so I'm, I'm really surprised mm -hmm. you remember this and you made me remember this episode of my life, which was fun because we were actually, as now Varlamov would call us, the first urbanists of the city <laughs> because we did actions on the street connected with urbanization. Uh, no one knew the word at that time, but we already uh, did something for the streets, for making more comfortable way of living in uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg. And it's very different, and different time, and uh, different situation, and different uh, uh, goal. Uh, the movement we are talking about now uh, will be, I hope, a coalition of different people it will not be a kind of leadership movement with one person at the head. And uh, secondary, of course, I think that uh, your past cannot be your life sentence. I mean, people change, people grow, people change views. It's okay if, if uh, they were part of uh, some other movements or even in were in United Russia, but now they sincerely want some changes, why not? It's, it's okay for me. I think it's, if you are sincere in that, I will be glad, join, <laughs> why not? <Thank> you. <laughs> Question over here to the left. Hi, good evening, my name is Emily Coleman and I am a journalism and Russian student at Penn State. And I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on the situation with Russian media and intimidation um, and threats against journalists at independent media outlets, and um, if you believe there's a way to um, improve uh, the U.S.-Russia relations with um, more coverage of both countries, for example, um, media outlet Medusa has recently partnered with BuzzFeed, and I was just wondering um, what your thoughts were on that. 
Well, of course, I, I'm here actually also for this too, because we are really having bad relations where we should understand that we are even uh, in worse situation than it was in Cold War, because then we had only Jackson and Vanek, and now we have huge pack of sanctions put on the country, which by the level of um, hostility is even more than in Cold War times. What can we do in this situation? We can form non-governmental links with each other, which I actually hear also here to form, and I meet lots of people. Uh, I, I try to make those connections because that's the field where different people from different spheres, scientists, politicians, journalists, can create this field of discussions on our future relationships on the compromises we are ready to make towards each other, on the steps that we are to follow. So I think now uh, it's only possible if Putin will have political will to do it. For me, the, the compromise that can be made is uh, quite evident. We should stop immediately any war in Donbass. We should take our troops out of Donbass. And for this, this is a good field to stop the sanctions against Russia. So this is the compromise which Putin, I think, should take. Well, but I'm not his advisor. And unfortunately, uh, he won't listen to me. But this is something that I would you know, strongly like to happen, because this is not the ideal situation. We're not discussing Crimea here, which actually should be discussed, but this is a compromise our countries, America and Russia, can afford to each other and can take both of them. So for me, that would be a good kind of step toward each other and toward reset, a real reset. But unfortunately, I cannot do it myself. So what I can do myself, I do it today. I form those non-governmental uh, non links, talks, um, you know, brainstorms with different parties on the field of the future relationships between our countries. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Xenia. Um, really, it's really awesome to be here, actually. <laughs> I, when I, Thank you. I found out you were coming here, it was just incredible, because I, like, I do watch your shows. I've seen you a lot on TV, Thank and you. it's just really weird to be speaking to you in English. <laughs> um, anyway, my name is Katya Bogomolova. I'm a junior in Columbia College, and I'm a political science student. And the reason I started learning things about political science is because, primarily because of Russian and Ukrainian politics, because the first thing they teach you in an American political science class about Russia is exactly what you said about czars, that no matter how the system changes, ultimately the people need that sense of traditionalism, that power top to down structure, because they feel a sense of comfort in that. Um, and you say that you're in with this campaign is with the young people. But from what it seems, both the young heirs and the young people in the middle class, which is for the first time rising in Russia, um, seems to revere and appreciate Putin um, and appreciate the system, finding ways to deal with the things they don't like, such as someone mentioned sending their kids abroad to boarding school and finding these ways out, but by no means ever being willing to change the system at all. They think he's a strong, traditional leader. They're in line with most of the traditional elements that he poses, but this is where you come in. And to put it bluntly, you have different views. We can all appreciate that now. You say that people underestimate you as a re reality TV host calling you things like the Paris Hilton of Russia, et cetera, but at the same time, you have to know that people realize your intelligence. They dismiss you for all of the above, but with the footnote like, oh, she might never lead, but she's smart. And given that this distinction happens, two things, like I guess two different sides of the same coin. How can you affect these people who have these views, these young people? Do you draw on your own stature and experiences from within the system? And if you really think that you're able to subvert the system in this way, how are you not afraid to do that? Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, about young Russians. Yes, you're totally right. I know you, you, you've read uh, the statistics or something, really, by, by many polls, even independent. 
there is this problem. Many young Russians, they really support Putin. And I can tell you why. Because their lives are quite comfortable. Those people, you know, these young people, they're quite career orientated. They want, you know, money. They want stability. And they have an understanding that now their lives are better than the lives of their parents. They can see it. They can feel it. So they have this feeling that, Look, we live now better than my parents did 20 years ago. So why bother? Why we should change something? It's much better than in the 19th for sure. So, well, let's not touch something that is working, you know. And that's where this stability law, uh, saying of Putin comes from, you know, because this is something where people are quite happy they got a little bit more than they had before. They get a little bit more every year. And even now, when stagnation is on an economy, I was talking about this, still they have this feeling that it's you know better than it was before. So this is why they support Putin. But there's one thing that will always play on my ground, and it's time. You know, time is on my side. Time is on, on the side of people who support those views. Because these people, they do not want isolation. They want to travel. They want to live in this open world. And for them, this rhetoric that comes around last past two years, for them, it's something out of the other world. Mm -hmm. They are for stability. They would have supported Putin for many years more, if he would not make this mistake of this highly conservatively radical rhetoric they're promoting now, with all this intolerance, isolation, you know, this circle of enemies around. This is not what young people want, even those who support Putin, and all the polls show it too, because they listen to American music, they love American and European fashion, they like traveling, they like, you know, boasting each other about traveling and being cosmopolitan. So they don't like the idea that they have to sit in one place, that everything is closed, and, you know, in an internet age, it's not even possible. So time is on my side, and uh, time is on the side of young people. That's why I, har I really believe that even though the situation is, like you've said, many people support Putin still, even from this age, this will change. This is already changing, and this is a big deal. Great. Thank so you. thank you so much. Thanks. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, uh. Well, as you say, but I think people are already, okay. look, no, sh sh we will see no, her no. in... <laughs> I know, if you are interested, you'll be on CNN tonight, right? <laughs> at, at 10 o'clock, is that, is that true as well? Yeah, so they will come home and again she's okay. there. No, come on. So if you don't <laughs> she's get enough like here, Putin, she's everywhere. We don't <laughs> want it anymore. <laughs> if you don't get enough here, you can stay up and watch CNN tonight as well. Question uh, over here, please. Hello, uh, my name is Dina, I'm a freelancer. So I couldn't call myself as a huge fan of you, but I really like your personality. And there is lots of things to learn from you because you are successful women, you're beautiful, uh, you're a great journalist. I love your interviews with uh, lots of politicians. And uh, also you ran the fashion magazine and uh, you were playing at the theater. So you're really interested in public figure. So uh, my question is, uh, don't you afraid, or don't you think that uh, you can stuck, if you go to that politician games, you can stuck and at that polit Russian politician swamp and a little drone and we will lose you uh, as a Ksenia Sapchak. Yes, which this can happen okay. and of course I'm afraid of that, but you know there is a point when you want to make something not for yourself, but you know, for some higher purpose. So that was a hard choice for me, and actually not all of my friends supported it because of this, what you're talking about. This is actually a very right question. Because maybe nothing will work out. Maybe I'll only get this all the way critics, even from my liberal friends, and uh, I won't be able to make what I'm dreaming about. This is possible. In Russia, it's more possible than in any other country. The chances of 
winning what I want, not winning the elections, but winning what I want, are much smaller than losing everything I have. But there is always a point when you think, okay, I already have a lot of money, I have businesses built by myself, I'm a self-made person who can now, you know, just stay at home with my family, think about next time going to Maldives and wear, you know, uh, good expensive clothes. But, you know, there is a way a Maslow pyramid works. You all know what I'm talking about. First you get it for yourself, then you want to get it for someone else. You want to live for a purpose. And you know, mm -hmm. when I came in um, here in uh, Columbia University, a very touching moment was that uh, a person who was receiving me here <laughs> gave me a letter and he said, this was my first article about your father. When I was... Uh, much younger than now, sorry for saying this, no, but, no, I, okay. <laughs> but my first article was about your father, firstly elected mayor of St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. And you know, my father passed away many years ago. But you cannot imagine how many people, even during this visit, I see who remember his books, give me those letters, show me photos with him, People here in America still remember how he lectured someone, mm -hmm. how he gave a photo, how he talked about Russia 20 or 30 years ago. And that's why he's with us now. He lives for me, he lives for the people he met. And this is much bigger than all the businesses I could build and all the fashion shows I can visit. And that's why I'm doing it. I want to do something really significant as my father did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific answer, and thanks for plugging my article. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, no, sorry. No, no. It was confidential, but I wanted no, no, no. to share it. It was so touching, really. Question over here, please. Ксения Анатольевна, здравствуйте. У меня достаточно короткий вопрос. Как известно, за рубежом живут много граждан Российской Федерации, следовательно. Они являются вашими потенциальными избирателями, так как у них есть право голоса. Что вы, как кандидат в президенты, можете предложить этим людям? Мне кажется, ни один из кандидатов не касался темы россиян, проживающих за рубежом. Один из кандидатов встречался в Лондоне с какими-то миллионерами. Но что вы можете предложить обычному простому человеку? Спасибо. Спасибо за ваш вопрос. Ну, я тогда, наверное, тоже отвечу по-русски, раз вы по-русски спрашиваете. Я, как уже сказала в своей речи, создам максимально комфортные условия для того, чтобы вы как минимум посещали Россию с удовольствием спустя много-много лет. Я знаю, что многие люди по-прежнему не ездят даже с визитами туда из Америки, потому что им кажется некомфортным нахождение в этой стране. А как максимум я сделаю все, чтобы молодые талантливые русские Люди, россияне, которые уехали когда-то по разным причинам из нашей страны, чтобы они захотели вернуться. И это нужно делать не угрозами, не бряцанием оружием, а делать так, чтобы создавать такие условия, и прежде всего экономические условия, чтобы люди сами захотели вернуться и делать что-то для нашей Родины. Вот. Спасибо. Take one, one more. Take, I think one more. One more question. I think is it one more? You think? Let's do one more. Yeah. Okay. Um, hello, Ksenia. My name is Katya Nadirova. I'm a Colombian Herman alumna. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you um, on being registered as an official presidential candidate today. <laughs> Thank you. That's really exciting. Um, and secondly, well, let's just emphasize a little bit. Let's say you won the elections and you are in the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. So what would be your first action? What would be your first decree? What would you do out of all those one, 123 things you said mm -hmm. are in your program? Thank you very much. Well, all the things are important, but as I've already said, I won't be original here because this is one of the 
core stones of my program. First of all, all the political prisoners should be let out of prison. You should understand that Russia is still a country with no rule of law, where any person can be put to prison just for his views. And that is regularly what is done. So first thing that should be ever done, those people should be free. And this is the most important th thing. So all the other things, uh, there are so many of them. It's like a question, you know, what is your favorite book? You know, only a person who read 10 books can answer this. If you, <laughs> if you read more, it's really difficult to say what is your one favorite. So many things, and I have a big program. You can read it on my site. It says uh, 123 steps, uh, hard steps towards a new Russia. And uh, I hope one day this program can be really realized in my country. So today, I thank you all for, for the feel I have from you, from the support of many of you, I feel, for the good words I've heard here, for even the presents I bring <laughs> from America. I'm like, you know, uh, Yukubovich in a famous show, <laughs> Poli Chudies, I'm coming home with presents. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that I convinced at least some of you that what I do is, first of all, not hopeless, and secondly, as my favorite hero, Jack Nicholson, in the f my, one of my favorite movies said, at least I've tried. So mm -hmm. at least I would try to mm. change something. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>